Well, I did that once. I didn't jump over a building, but I did jump out of an airplane once. I want to tell you about it because it was quite an interesting experience, as you might imagine. Anybody here ever jumped out of an airplane, been skydiving before? I know he has over there. So it was one of those situations where I went with my brothers. We wanted to do this for a long time, and we were down in Hastings, and uh, so we just by, we kind of drew lots here. So I got two. I have three brothers, so I was two out of four. So one brother had already gone. So I went up, and they give you this little altimeter on your wrist. We went up to about 11,000 feet, and then they opened the door. And I've been in a lot of airplanes, but I've never been in one that they opened the door before. And there's nothing quite like just looking over and seeing clouds underneath you. And then you got to kind of scoot over. You got to kind of get your self-position there. And uh, I'm just going to use the stool for a second. And so you kind of scoot over to the edge. And then your feet are hanging over. And I just remember looking at my feet. It was just the weirdest thing to see your feet and just to see nothing underneath. And uh, so I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, you know, why did I pay to do this? And I asked the guy, how many people have backed out of this? And he said, in all the years I've ever done it, only one has backed out. And it was a girl. So I thought, well, maybe I could be the first guy. I don't know. And so I'm sitting there. Now, the other part about it is that there's two, two ways to do it when you jump for the first time. You can, you can jump by yourself, but it's a tether jump where you're actually kind of attached to the plane. And as soon as you jump out, it deploys your chute, and you don't really get that free fall, which is kind of what, to me, the experience a lot of it is about. So I thought, I wanted the free fall experience. But to do that, you have to do a tandem jump, which means you have to go with like an expert. My expert's name was Tony, and Tony was attached right to my back. He was like right here. I would turn around and there he was. Hello. And it was a little, little awkward because it was pretty close, you know? So I'm sitting there and, uh, so he's like, all right, scoot out. So I'm scooting out and then there's the wing out here. And then there's a little brace underneath the wing that attaches, you know, to the body of the plane. And so I grabbed onto that thing and that thing became my best friend. And I just did not want to let go. And Tony was like, all right, just in my ears, like, all right, it's time to go. And I'm like, no, it's not time to go yet. (laughs) And so he reached up very bromantically and just took my hand (laughs) and pulled it off and said, let's do this. So jumped out. And so what you do when you jump out is you jump out and then you kind of arch your back. And, you know, we're falling at 120 miles an hour towards the earth. And I'm just thinking, again, this is the most surreal experience And I was so glad that I was not alone because that's a scary thing. Now, as we're going, Tony's done this hundreds of times. And so we're going, and then he gives me the tap on the shoulder time to pull the chute. So I pulled the chute, and you go from, like, really loud to very quiet and still. So I feel the chute go out, and then something happened. I'm not exactly sure what. And Tony said something. I cannot say the word that he said from stage here that he said, but the word, when he said the word, I probably did the word. I'll just say, I'll just leave it there. All right. It's not a word you want to hear your skydiving experts say when the shoot comes out. And I think it came out. So, um, so I'm, I'm going, you know, what's going on. And then I guess things got twisted up or something. And then all of a sudden, we're floating, and there it was. And really what it comes down to, what, it came down to that one moment where you're sitting there, and you, you're prepared for this. You paid for this. You came to do this, but then you have to jump. It really comes down to that one moment. And I actually sat and had second thoughts, like, should I do this? Am I going to do this? But taking that one moment was really what made the experience all what it was. And that's really, that's exactly what we're talking about. And last week, Darren was here with us and did a wonderful job. We're talking about this series, talking about being all in. And when it comes to our faith, 
we've got to be all in. See, the thing about that skydiving moment is once you commit to that moment, you can't go back. And that's really represents so much about our faith and our journey with God in this life is that when you commit to it, there's no going back. And when you see what God can do, when you see what he will do, what he wants to do. And for many of us that have been committed to our faith and committed to Christ over a long period of time, we could stand up, all of us individually, and talk about the faithfulness of God when we chose to just go all in with our faith. And that's really where we're going to go today, talking about a man named Joshua. So we're in week two of this series. And what we're doing in the series is we're looking at different characters in the Bible, and we're looking particularly for what was their all-in moment. Now, throughout the years, I've asked hundreds of people this question. Tell me the moments that have changed your life. Tell me the moment, the defining time when you felt like your life changed. There was a trajectory change or a direction that changed or, or some moment. And I've been interested over the years. It's fascinating to me to hear about these moments because these moments come in some, some of the most random times for people. I remember talking with a, a good friend of mine that I grew up with and he said, I was mowing my grass one day and I had a moment that changed my life. Talk with other people, they go, I was sitting on an airplane and I had a moment that changed my life. I was driving my car. I woke up in the middle of the night. All these different times and places. Sometimes it was in a setting like this where we're gathered together. But I want you to think about moments in your life that have changed everything. It may have come from the most random place. It may have been a chance meeting or gathering or thought, or conversation, whatever it might be, but there's something that changed your life. And when it comes to our faith, choices can unlock divine moments. And I believe that for some of you, there's a moment for you that you're really close to. You may not even realize it yet, but there's a moment that's waiting for you that when you go all in for your faith, when you go all in and trust God, Now, for some of you, that means trusting him for the first time. You've never trusted him before. Maybe you've never committed your life to Christ. And we're praying today that that today would be a day where you would do that for the first time. But for some of you, you've made that decision before. You've trusted Christ, but, but there's a moment now where you have to trust him. And fear is creeping in. And you have to make a choice. And we're going to see what Joshua did today when he made his choice Now, as Jeff and Amy mentioned, we've got Easter coming up. And there's a couple things I want to talk to you about that are important that are coming up here for our church. Today is is an important day in the church calendar because it's Palm Sunday. And some of you may know what that is. Some of you may not. Today was a day all around the world where churches will be celebrating the moment where Jesus came into Jerusalem just a few days before he was crucified and resurrected. It was a day where they, the crowds praised him. And they began to recognize who he was. And it was a day today that we celebrate on Palm Sunday where Jesus revealed to the world in a very strategic way that he was indeed the king of kings as he came into Jerusalem. And so we celebrate that today. And and this week is Holy Week. And this week we're going to be celebrating things like Good Friday. And then next Sunday we're going to celebrate Easter. Now, a couple things about next week for Easter. Easter, though, there's going to be a lot of people here. And those of you that are regulars at daybreak, I'm going to ask you to do whatever you can to make our guests feel welcome here. Make them feel like this is a place that could be their home. Because there will be people that walk through our doors next week. That They'll be looking. They'll be searching. They're looking for an answer. Some are aware of it and some maybe aren't yet. But they're looking They're looking for something. They're looking for a divine moment. And they can experience one here with us. So if you're a regular here at Daybreak, I'm going to ask you to to maybe take the back seat or the side seat or the middle seat or whatever you can to make our guests feel welcome. And I want to encourage you. People are wide open to be uh, accept invitations. So invite people. Bring them with you. And uh, let's see... uh, 
God do some miracles next week. We've got something really special planned, and I know that there will be a divine moment for many of us next week. There's one more thing that's a little, a little off to the side here, but I just want to share because it's pretty heavy on my heart, and it's something that I want each and every one of you to consider being a part of, and that's we do a monthly prayer gathering. We didn't say much at first. We kind of kept it secret just to see who, who would show up. And we've been talking about it lately, but the Wednesday after Easter, we're doing our monthly prayer gathering, but we're going to do something different. And I just want to share my heart with you for a second about it because it's important to me, and I know it's important to many of you. We are going to be praying for our area schools. Now, if you're at all been engaged in any kind of news media in the last few weeks and months, there is, there is a battle raging at our schools. And here's what I know from being involved with students and on campuses for 30 years, is that there's never been a time where the school has been more prominent in people's minds. And schools are the most strategic mission fields in the United States, just in case you wondered. It's where our future is being birthed. And there's a lot of misunderstandings, there's a lot of anger, there's a lot of grief, there's a lot of conflict. And unfortunately, some of the people that are experiencing that, the worst are our kids and a lot of our teachers. And so what we are going to do as a church is we are going to pray for our schools. If you're a parent, I want you to be there with us. It's the Wednesday after Easter, seven o'clock, right here at daybreak. We're gonna pray for our schools. We're gonna pray for teachers by name in our community. I was talking to a teacher just a few days ago and here's what she said to me. She said, in my second grade class, I have a, a student that's joining, that's in second grade, that says that they're transgender. Second grade. All the confusion around our kids. And we wanna support all of our children in our community and we wanna support our teachers. There's a lot of good people in our schools that are just hanging by a thread and what we can do as a church the first and foremost and the most important thing we can do is to pray. So I wanna invite you to join me and many of us that will be gathered the Wednesday after Easter. Sound good? Okay, announcement over. Okay, good. Okay. Well, let's look at the story today. We're looking in uh, Numbers. And Numbers is in the Old Testament. It's the first part of the Bible and it's, primarily the story about God's people Israel and you can kind of see where we are here in the story up there in the Old Testament towards the beginning the fourth book in our Bibles and we're coming up on a part where Moses is God's leader and he is leading God's people out of slavery in Egypt and they've already gotten through that and now he's taking them to a promised land he's taking them to a land that he promised to give them they were slaves in Egypt and now they're on their way. And so what Moses does is he says, I want you to take one person from each of the 12 tribes of this nation of Israel. They're broken up into 12 different groups and one representing each group. And he sent them into this promised land, kind of covert as spies. And they come back with a report. And here's what we see in Numbers 13. So they, these 12 spies, they came back to Moses and Aaron and the whole Israelite community at Kadesh in the desert of Paran. And they reported to them and to the whole assembly and showed them the fruit of the land. They gave Moses this account. We went into the land which you sent us and it does flow with milk and honey. Here is its fruit. But the people who live there are powerful and the cities are fortified and very large. We even saw descendants of Anak there the Amalekites live in the Negev. The Hittites, the Jebusites, and the Amorites live in the hill country. And the Canaanites live near the sea and all along the Jordan. So here what we see is there's an agreement that every single one of these 12 spies, they all agree on basically one thing. They all say that the land is good. When they all go in to spy this land, they come back and they bring the fruit and they say, it indeed is an incredible place. I mean, look at the fruit. It's a land flowing with milk and honey. This is a, a term used that meant that it was just abundance that was waiting there in this land of Canaan. So there's so much there. And they all agreed that the promised land 
was good. Now they went back and they remembered, I'm sure, what God had spoken to them. God had said, listen, I'm taking you from one place to another. And so you can kind of see where they entered in here on this map. You can kind of see where they're coming in from. They're coming from Egypt. They came around and they're going into this land of Canaan. And so here they are and they're going in and they're checking it out and they're remembering God's promise. God said, I'm going to take you from one place to the other. Now, every word in scripture is there for a reason. Sometimes it may not be quite so obvious why some of these scriptures are here. This book of Numbers is a lot of records. There's a lot of numbers. There's an account of who was there and how many and the names of the families. And sometimes it can seem tedious. But this story has so many very obvious parallels to us that are following Jesus. Because Jesus takes us from a life of sin and slavery and he takes us to a good place. And here's what we need to remember about where God is taking us as his people is that he's taking us to a good place. God's taking you to a good place. God is taking you from wherever you are in your life and his desire is to take you to some place that's good. And some of you may not believe that. Some of you may doubt that. We've got people with us on Daybreak Live today and maybe you're on Daybreak Live and you're kind of exploring this thing called faith and you're checking it out and you're wondering and you're not really sure and maybe you're here in the house and you feel the same way and you go, is there a God and is that God good? And if that God is real, does he really care about me personally? And every word of scripture supports the fact that God loves you, he knows you, he cares for you and he has a place that he wants to take you to that's good. Now our ultimate destination is eternity, it's heaven, it's the presence of God. And you know, life can be tough and difficult and you may wonder with all the struggles and hardships that I'm going through right now, Jeff, how can God be good? I wanna remind you that God has a destination for you and that destination is heaven. And that place is accessible to each and every one of us here in the house and on Daybreak Life. That place is accessible because of what we're celebrating this week. A God that came down to earth in human form to love us and to care for us. So God has a good place that he's taking you. But here's the thing that you'll see in scripture. God, God will, he'll move heaven and earth to do it. And he's patient with us just as he was with these people, as he is moving them through the wilderness and getting them to the promised land. But let me tell you, it was not easy for God. These people doubted and they complained and they stopped and they questioned and they rebelled. And all those stories are there in scripture, but among them was a young man named Joshua who we've been reading about this week. And here's what we find in the next part of the story. So they come back and then it says in verse 30, so Caleb, one of the 12 spies, he silenced the people before Moses and he said this, we should go up and take possession of the land for we can certainly do it. But the men who had gone up with him said, we can't attack these people. They're stronger than we are. And then they spread amongst the Israelites a bad report about the land that they'd explored. And they said, the land we're exploring devours those living in it. And all the people we saw there are of great size. We saw the Nephilim there, the descendants of Anak that come from the Nephilim. These are big people, like imagine NBA players, okay? And it says, we seem like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we looked the same to them. So that night, all the members of the community raised their voices and they wept aloud. And all the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron. And the whole assembly said to them, listen to what they say. If only we had died in Egypt. You remember that's where they were slaves. Or in this wilderness. Why is the Lord bringing us to this land only to let us fall by the sword? Our wives and our children will be taken as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to each other, We should choose a leader and go back to Egypt. So there was a majority of these of these spies. We find out in the next few verses that there's 10 out of the 12 that said, we cannot do this. 
what you find there is that the majority of these spies that were sent there as their leaders, as their people of influence, there's no doubt they just didn't pick the ordinary Joes here. They said, give us the best and let's send them in as spies to see what's going on. And the majority said, we will fail if we try this. And if you look at their vocabulary, we can't attack these people. We can't do it. They're stronger than we are. And they spread amongst, they spread a bad report. They said, everything in this land is devoured by it. Everything they had to say was failure. And notice they said, it would be better for us if we went back to where we came from. They were living in the past. They were living where they were looking behind them, thinking the days were better behind them than they were ahead of them. And what we're going to find here is there were two of these spies, Joshua and Caleb, that were the odd people out here. And they said, no, this is not a moment of failure. But notice that the, this situation, and I, I, I just ran the number. I was, I was curious, like, what is the percentage of two out of 12? And it's 83%. So 83% of these spies said it's impossible. It can't happen. It's not going to happen. That's all they could see. They couldn't see the victory. They couldn't remember the promise. They couldn't live by faith, but they saw the impossible. And what we're going to find here in this situation is that while 83% were saying no, two of them, 17% of these 12 spies were saying yes. The majority saw the failure. And I want you to think about your life for a minute. I want you to think about your position. I want you to think about where your mindset is. I want you to think about if you were one of those 12 spies, if you were to walk into that place and think about how intimidating it could have been to go in there and expect failure. To go in there and think, can we do this? To go in there and see the size of some of these people and say, can it be done? Can we come in here as foreigners? Can we come in here as nomads, as wonders? Can we do this? And it reminds me of what I see a lot today. You know, when I look around at a lot of Christians, I see a mentality of failure. When I see people that they're, they're trusting Christ with their lives and their eternity, but all they see in front of them is doom and gloom. All they see in front of them is what can't be done. All they see in front of them is, well, this won't work out, or this won't happen, or we're not able to do this, or that's impossible. And I notice here that Joshua and Caleb stood out because they had faith, they believed, and it wasn't because they were great. They didn't say, well, you know, we can do this by ourselves. You know what they were saying? God is with us. God told us. God showed us, God led us, God taught us, God reminded us, God was patient with us, and here we are, and God is in this. And some of you, you may look at the world and you may think, as a Christian, we're losing. And I can't tell you the number of people, in fact, I would say the majority of Christian people that I know have a defeatist attitude about the world. And I will tell you, I used to be that person. I used to think the church and its best days are behind us. I was living in the past. I was thinking about what was instead of what will be, what could be, what God wants. And I wanna tell you, I mentioned this about schools and many of you that are parents, you're worried you're fearful, you're angry, you're confused, you don't know what to do. And parents, let me say this to you. If you believe the church is failing, you're believing a lie. If you look at the world, if you look at politics, if you look at your workplace, if you look at society, if you look at media, if you look at Will Smith, pick a topic and you think all is lost. Let me remind you, in the first few weeks here as your pastor, last summer, if you were here, we spent four weeks in Matthew 16, and Jesus said, I will build my church, and listen to the promise, and the gates of hell 
will not prevail against it. Do you believe? Do you believe that's true? You could say it with your mouth, yes, but does your mindset, does your attitude, does your life point to the fact that there is life within you when you're following Jesus, that there is something that can change this world, and that is the good news, that God came to change us and to rescue us from our sin. All of us. All of us. That is what we're talking about. So while the majority expected failure, there were these two young men, Joshua and Caleb, and listen to their response in verse 5. So then Moses and Aaron, they fell face down in front of the whole Israelite assembly. Moses was their leader, Aaron was his brother, and they're leading these people, and this bad report is spread, and it said they fell face down. And it says, Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of Jephunneh, who were among those who explored the land, they tore their clothes. That was a symbol of grief, that was a symbol of mourning, and that was a symbol of loss. And here's what they said to the entire Israelite assembly. The land that we pass through and explored is exceedingly good. If the Lord is pleased with us, he will lead us into that land, a land flowing with milk and honey, and he will give it to us. Only do not rebel against the Lord. And do not be afraid of the people of the land because we will devour them. Their protection is gone, but the Lord is with us. Do not be afraid of them. Do you see the difference there? Do you see what the minority is saying? The minority and what their expectations are? The minority is saying, no, this victory is ours because God is with us. Their protection is gone and now here we are and we will take this place. Even though the, we're the minority opinion, even though everyone else and the majority believes and disagrees with us, and they believe that we will fail, they said, we believe that the victory is there. We believe that God is in this. We believe that their protection is God. We believe that we will devour them. We believe that we will take this land. And their vocabulary, if you look at it, is completely different. They said, the land is good. The Lord is pleased with us and he will lead us. He will give it to us. Do not be afraid because we will devour them. The Lord is with us. There's so many things happening there where their vocabulary reveals their faith. You know, there's moments. One of the books that I've, I've been reading is... It's called Chasing Daylight, Seizing the Power of Every Moment by Erwin McManus. I want you to hear what he says here about moments. He says, I reflect on my life. It seems that a handful of moments shape the texture of my entire life. I'm convinced that most of us could summarize our lives around five or six defining moments. Moments that if we had chosen differently would have radically altered the trajectory of of our lives. And when I read that, it had been several years that I'd been interested in asking people about their moments in their life. But you know, there are moments that happen, and, and Joshua finds himself in this moment where he thinks, Can I remember and trust God for what he said? You know, I've had some pretty divine moments in my life. One was July 29th, 1991, at 7 p.m. Eastern. I was in Roanoke, Virginia. I was traveling as a student, and I saw a young lady. And at that time, she went by the name Anna. And I met her, and we were standing in line for the snack bar. It was so romantic. And I had a divine moment. I don't know if her moment was quite as divine as mine, but I had a divine moment. And we ended up going to college together. And as she, I met this young lady, and she came to college that fall and her birthday being in September, I just, I didn't have two dimes to rub together. I was poor. I really didn't have much going for me, honestly. But I, I, I was like, I can do this. And so I scraped together some money and I bought, this is how big time I was. I bought one rose for her on her birthday. We were just friends at the time. But I'm like, I'm going to give her one rose. I'm sitting in the cafeteria one day and someone comes up to me and go, hey, you know Arianna Breckeisen, right? And I said, yeah. And they said, well, there's a delivery for here from, 
from back home where she was from in Virginia. And it was like two dozen roses <laughs> from a guy. And they said, will you deliver these to her? And I had a moment to think about that. I had a moment to think, could I write maybe my name on there? Would she know? So I went to deliver these flowers to her. And as I took them to her, I noticed that in her room, she had a bunch of flowers from a bunch of guys, not just me. Mine was just this little thing. And I was so embarrassed and I was thought, I, Maybe the world wouldn't believe I have a chance, but I have a chance. And I was nervous. And I imagined just sitting down to have, you know, the talk with her and my words getting mixed up and me saying something like, what are the chances of a girl like me and a guy like you <laughs> being together, you know? And in my mind, I imagine her saying, you know, the chances are about one in a million. And you know what some of you, what I'm thinking is, so you're saying there's a chance. <laughs> you know what I mean? And uh, it worked out. 29 years later, it worked out. <laughs> it was pretty good. I, if I look back at myself, I'd say, I don't think I have a chance. <laughs> and some of you believe that about yourself. You just don't think you got much going for you. You don't think God's on your side. You have lost sight of God's faithfulness. And as I was just thinking and praying this morning, I looked at Deuteronomy 7. And listen to what Moses says a little bit later on. You may say to yourselves, the nations are stronger than we are. How can we drive them out? But do not be afraid of them. Remember well what the Lord your God did to Pharaoh and all to Egypt. And if you know what he's referencing there, you know the miracles. You saw with your own eyes the great trials, the signs and the wonders and the mighty hand and outstretched arm with which the Lord God brought you out. The Lord your God will do the same to all the peoples that you now fear. Some of you are afraid. Some of you are confused. But you know, you fail when you forget God's faithfulness. That's where the failure is, is when you forget the faithfulness of God in your life. And some of you maybe aren't even aware of it yet, but God has been faithful to you. And God has something for you. And what God is asking from you is for you to be all in. God is asking not that you sit and you hold on to that bar and you just watch your moment go by. God is saying, I want you to go all in and to trust me, I will lead you. And when you start to forget about the faithfulness of God, that's when you fail. It doesn't all rest on your shoulders. It's not about you being perfect. It's not about you saying, I got this all together. What it's about is it's about you saying, God, I'm gonna trust you every moment, every step, no matter what comes my way, no matter how big it might look, no matter how daunting it might feel, no matter how discouraged I've been, no matter the mistakes of my past, God, I know that you're there and I know that you're faithful. And this morning, I just can't help but think there's some of you here and some of you on Daybreak Live that might say, I've never trusted God before. Every week we've had someone give their life to Christ for many, many weeks. I believe there's a divine moment for someone, for someone. And I also know that God God has been stirring some of you and you've been afraid and you've had that majority opinion where you've expected failure and God wants to take you over into that 17% and you can say, I believe and I trust and I obey. I remember God's faithfulness. 
I'm going to invite you to stand. We're going to sing a song together. Stand if you would. We're going to sing this song of God's faithfulness, and it's a celebration. And this might be a divine moment for you. And if it is, maybe you want to step forward today and just pray up here at the front during this song. And if you want to do that, you're welcome to do that. If God has a moment for you, if you're watching on Daybreak Live and you want to interact or talk, we've got people there that are interacting with you now. But let's celebrate the goodness and the faithfulness of God. I've been held in your hands From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head Oh, I will sing Of the goodness of God And all my life you have been faithful And all my been so good he's been so good and as we uh i just want to pray for you before you go 
And as everyone's looking at me right now, and if you're on Daybreak Live, I'm just going to ask, is anyone here today say, I want to trust Christ for the first time? Just raise your hand. Let me see it. And I want to say a special prayer. For anyone. If you're on Daybreak Live, let us know. Anyone here this morning? It's felt like asking. I'm so grateful to be here today. Have you been... Have you been experiencing God today, this morning? Have you heard his voice? I just, I just believe his word today is for some of you, very specifically, that there's a divine moment that's right around the corner for you. And God's there. He's, he wants to lead you through it. And he will. And he's faithful. So, Father, I pray for my friends. I thank you for my brothers and sisters here today. And those with us on Daybreak Live, we've gathered here today because we want to understand more what this life is like to walk with you on a journey of faith. And so, Lord, wherever we might be, maybe investigating that journey, maybe thinking about it, asking questions, or maybe we're, we're far along. doesn't matter, Lord. You're faithful all the way. Lord, we don't want to miss the divine moments where you're calling us to go all in. And this moment that defined Joshua's life, God, may we be defined by these moments where we trusted you with everything. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So good to be with you. Look forward to seeing you on Easter.